Hello, everyone. Very warm welcome to all, and a big thank you all for joining us today okay, at our this NGO CSW 65 virtual forums parallel event, where we will be discussing about women's empowerment, as well as mental health advocacy and promotion for women during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, just a short introduction. My name is Yen Teng, or you can address me by my initials, YD. I am from Silver Ribbon Singapore, a non-profit organization that focuses on mental health advocacy, and I will be the moderator for today's parallel event. So before we begin, I would just like to gently remind everyone to keep our mics on mute during the presentations so as to minimize disruptions. We will definitely have time for Q&A after all the speakers have presented. Okay, so save all your questions for the speakers until that segment. So for today's parallel event, we are so happy to have four esteemed speakers in order of presentation. Okay, we have Dr. Dr. Ingrid, the president of the World Federation for Mental Health, Professor Gabriel, president of the World Dignity Project, Ms. Claudia, deputy CEO of the Global Mental Health Peer Network, as well as Ms. Portia, executive director of Silver Ribbon Singapore. Okay. They will be sharing more about their organization, as well as the initiatives and strategies implemented to promote mental health, especially for women, during this pandemic. So, without further ado, let us invite the very first speaker, Dr. Ingrid. Dr. Ingrid, please. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's a real honor for me to be here today and be sharing this panel with the very esteemed uh, presenters. Um, I'm president of the World Federation for Mental Health, as I was introduced, and I really just want to say it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be here and to be able to share a little bit about the World Federation for Mental Health before I launch into um, our view on the specific and very important subject on women's empowerment and mental health advocacy and promotion for women, particularly during the very difficult time that the world Basis. So the World Federation for Mental Health is an international membership organization founded in 1948 um, to advance among all peoples and nations the prevention of mental and emotional disorders, the proper treatment and care of those with such disorders, and the promotion of mental health. Our mission is a very clear one. And our mission is to promote the advancement of mental health awareness, prevention of mental disorders, advocacy and best practice recovery focus interventions worldwide. And in relation to today's um, focus, specifically, we are looking at women and the challenges that women face during this time. So the women's section of the World Federation for Mental Health states very clearly that women face different types of difficulties from birth until adulthood. In other words, across the lifespan, which increases their vulnerability to mental health problems. In developing countries, this primarily includes, but not limited to a wide range of discriminatory practices as well. Women also face economic, social, um, sorry, low economic and social uh, independence in most of the stages of their lives, with high exposure to domestic abuse, poor availability of resources for individual, familial, and societal levels to deal with the and deal with the negative, finding it difficult to deal with the negative consequences. So when we look at specifically women during COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that COVID-19 global health pandemic has impacted on the mental health of millions of people across all nations. And this virus not only impacts on the health outcomes, but has a negative symbiotic relationship with mental health, which compromises millions affected and infected. So when we look at the six disaggregated data, we know that globally, gender disparities along the clinical pathways remain pretty stable. However, more women are being tested than men and account for slightly more than half of the global confirmed cases of COVID-19. However, men make up a higher share of reported hospitalizations, intensive care admissions and deaths 
globally. Currently, the global data show that for every 10 women with COVID-19 who die, there are 15 deaths amongst men. So mental health effects of a COVID-19 pandemic on women specifically, we know that gender is a critical determinant of mental health and mental um, illness. Gender determinants or determines the differential power and control men and women have over the socioeconomic determinants of their mental health and their lives. Depressive disorders account for 41.9% 41 41 of disability from neuropsychiatric disorders amongst women, compared to 293 for men. Leading mental health problems of older adults, and these are women, are depression, organic syndrome, and dementias. A majority of these are women. An estimated 80% of 50 million people affected by violent conflict, civil wars, disasters, and displacement of women and children. Lifetime prevalence rates of violence against women range from 16 to 50%, according to the World Health Organization. Recent research has shown a higher prevalence of symptoms of stress, anxiety, and depression. In, female, in the female population during the COVID-19 pandemic. Studies in China, and we know that the virus spread from Wuhan in China, have found that female gender is significantly associated with higher self-reported levels of stress, anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress symptoms, and more severe overall psychological impact with COVID-19. Women have a higher prevalence of risk factors known to intensify during the pandemic, including chronic environmental strain, pre-existing depressive and anxiety disorders, including exposure to domestic violence. COVID-19 pandemic has affected more women profoundly than men in several areas, both at the workplace, and especially for health and social sectors, which makes up the majority of women. And at home, with an increased workload due to lockdown and quarantine measures, and we know that worldwide 70% of the health force is made up of women who are often frontline workers. Then there's the economic hardship that women face during COVID-19, which is greater for women, according to the World Bank. Informal workers, most of whom are women, account for more than 90% of the labor force in sub-Saharan Africa. Informal sector jobs are particularly at risk, as we know, during this very difficult time across the globe. During COVID-19, we saw, and there's been a lot of discussion and media exposure around the increase in inter-partner violence. In many countries affected by COVID-19, records for helplines, police force, and other service providers increased over this period. Seeing an increase in domestic violence, in particular child maltreatment and intimate partner violence, according to the World Health Organization. Violence against women is increasing and has increased during COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. Female activists or Activists in Kenya reported a significant increase of 34% during the first three weeks. In South Africa alone, where I'm based, gender-based violence call centers recorded a number of calls which doubled in the first four days in March of last year when we went into lockdown. In fact, the president in South Africa identified gender-based violence during the COVID-19 pandemic as the second parallel pandemic which women faced during these uh, months um, that we encountered, where we encountered um, specifically the impact of COVID-19. We know that women, for women, home was not a safe place. For many women, they were confronted by gender-based violence. Women often felt trapped and disconnected from safe outlets and support. 
Almeida et al. 2020 in their study stated that due to isolation guidelines implemented across countries, in effect, in many places, victims of intimate partner violence were deprived of the option to stay with a friend or family member or go to domestic shelters or even found it difficult to file for protective orders and get the necessary protection required. They stated that gender disparities may have accentuated particularly for employed women or single parents as women are disproportionately responsible as we know for the bulk of domestic tasks, including child and, and elder care. They added that women who were pregnant, postpartum, miscarrying, or experiencing intimate partner violence were especially at high risk for developing mental health problems during this time. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated very clearly, he said that the COVID pandemic is having a devastating impact on women and girls. And the fallout has shown how deeply gender inequalities remain embedded in the world's political, social, and economic systems. So what do we need to do? A real call for action around awareness, advocacy, and interventions. And the call to action is we require greater awareness and attention to be drawn to the specific gender-linked challenges which women face daily during COVID-19, as well as post-COVID-19. Government policies should include violence protection and prevention and responses to the pandemic, which has preparedness and response plans to mitigate against this risk. Almeida stated that social support measures are key to protective and preventive factors to reduce mental health challenges faced by women during this time. And these include measures for women at high risk of intimate partner violence, such as access to hotlines, 24-hour emergency apps, which are immediate um, in terms of getting response and support and protection, and regular checkings on these women who find themselves in these difficult um, situations, providing parents support and reducing isolation for women, and most of all, as well, to create social and financial safety network, net, uh, networks for women and the girl child, including those that will protect their livelihoods. And most of all, that we prioritize the mental health of women. So a very, sorry, a very clear call to action. The women's section of the World Federation for Mental Health in their action plan, and I'm just extracting three key points, is to add the advocacy for the rights of women and protection of vulnerable communities is essential. To identify the special needs of migrant and refugee women and prioritize awareness and calls to action against gender-based violence. Recently, the Women's Section of the World Federation hosted a webinar focusing on women's mental health. And this focused primarily on women as caregivers, as well as essential service workers, the challenges and supports that they require. So in conclusion, the United Nations policy brief on COVID-19, um, the need for action on mental health states very clearly that although COVID-19 crisis is in the first instance, a physical health crisis, it has its seeds in major mental health crisis as well, if action is not taken. Good mental health is critical for the function of our society. The United Nations Secretary General further stated that it is critical that we place women and, the, and girls at the center of a current and post-pandemic recovery and reconstruction. Women's equal participation is a game changer. And it is the game changer that we need. We need to move beyond fixing women to instead fixing our systems. Pandemic recovery is a chance to chart a path to equal future rights for women. In closing, Kofi Annan said, when women thrive, all of society benefits. So let us prioritize the mental health of women 
and a girl child during these difficult times that we face as a global community. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid, for sharing about the different challenges faced by women during the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the financial difficulties, as well as the different types of violence that they might encounter. And I think, you know, what was really helpful was the data that you have shared, as well as the different initiatives and calls to actions, you know, that is catered to protect women's rights and mental health. Okay, thank you so much for sharing once again, Dr. Ingrid. Now let us invite our second speaker, Professor Gabriel, to share with us more about the World Dignity Project. Professor Gabriel, please. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, special session. I'm very grateful for many reasons. I'm very grateful for many reasons. You know, first of all, to be able to share with very powerful women on this uh, uh, forum. I am the only man, I'm, and it's good to be a minority for a change. You know, so so I want to say thank you for that opportunity. I am, I am uh, Professor Debele Vidal, I'm a president of the World Dignity Project. I also wear another hat because I do support the World Project for Mental Health. I'm the current Secretary General. So, and I want to thank again the WFMA for, for that opportunity. I have no conflict to declare. I want to say thank you very much for this forum and especially my good friend, Posh Poo, for inviting me and uh, all the people who have supported my work and all the participants. Because I think the participants make the game, make this allow us to do the best we can do. And I want to share from everybody. I've worked a long way with, with many people, with service users, partners, families, researchers, institutions. So I'm going to be taking extracts from some of the things I've learned along the way. And I hope that uh, I'll be able to also thank them as we go along. What do I intend to cover? I want to highlight the need for us to work together to support women's empowerment. I agree with Ingrid that women are the key to the society. They hold the they are the fabrics, you know. And really, how do we support it and make sure they do they do all the good things they have been doing and support them? I also want to look at the impact of COVID nineteen on the dignity of women, so especially on that issue because you know I'm looking at it from the dignity perspective and hopefully propose some way forward. So let me tell you briefly about the dignity project. The dignity project. It's, a, it's an NGO currently you know, with our office in London. The concept for it actually began in New York many years ago, and really, and it's got three key pillars. A public pillar to allow us to engage with the public, to ensure that the public is aware of our, the mental challenges and be able to come up, to be able to say the things that they know and want to do differently. It also has a, a, a pillar for professionals because we know that professionals have a key role so for, for many people who have mental illness or their families, when they go for professional services, sometimes the service they get is not what they expect. So, so there's a company for that. But you cannot have the public, the, the people who live the experience and the professional without the policymakers. Because you, have, you need appropriate policies and laws that will make things happen. And really, so that's often one of the things lacking in advocacy that we speak to ourselves, we, we speak to our colleagues, we agree, but we, we don't advocate enough for the legal framework and policy that will guide what we do. So the World Dignity Project has especially focus on that, you know, and if we have time, I can talk a bit more. The good thing about the Dignity Project is that we have a very strong trustees. And again, it's by coincidence, 50-50, 50% women, 50% men, you know, and really so, and they come from all walks of life and all continents of the world, and they help us to drive our agenda uh, in, 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 and also carry out research, you know, in, in the field. I'm talking about research, we like to hear from the public, you know, so because we've got a lot of research talking to the public all over the world. So we're bringing their concepts and their thinking into our policies, and then we try to use this to engage policymakers, citizens, and co. So really, so that's kind of what we do. And what, one of the things we try to define is what we call the, the dignity taxonomy, that what are the key things that promote dignity? And it's about this individual, you know, how people feeling curtailed and supported, about the journey of hope, that at the end of the day, we need hope. So where even when we are distressed and working with societies, and this is very critical when we talk about women issue, that often that we don't promote enough hope for women, and also the family don't value what they do. And I hopefully I can cover, cover some of that in the next series of talk. I said earlier on that women hold the society together. I agree with that, because I can say for myself, 
without my mom, I would not be myself. You know, I would not be here because my father used to work, he used to travel around the world, you know. But my mom was there all the time. She was a constant person in the family that held all of us together. And she provided the discipline, allowed us to do our homework and to, you know, and everything. So really, so, but often we don't show it, we don't see it, you know, because it's in, in the house. Because, you know, so I really say, I think we need to actually begin to highlight the good work women do. And, uh, and we need to respect them. And the COVID-19 has allowed us to see some of the challenges that they faced, you know, that we, we've not been able to talk about. So for example, one of the work we did in the Dignity Project was we look at the psychological impact of COVID-19 pandemic on people. And then when, when we found out for what women were telling us in our survey all over the world, very some of them are very distressing, you know? And then first of all, women find they were the one doing most of the housework during COVID-19, even when their partners are at home. They are the one doing the schoolwork, you know, because schools have to close, you have to become a teacher a mother, a teacher, it's, more, it's very difficult to be a teacher and a mom at the same time. One, you need to, to provide discipline, the other one, you need to show love. So you have that. People felt isolated, they were lonely, they couldn't, they, you know, they, they had nowhere to go to. So really, so this paper actually highlights what the stories and what women were seeing all over the world. I want to say something, it's not only in Europe, so it's not only in Africa, it's not only in China, it's all over, women face the same, problem all the time. So, and often we try to come, come, you know, present them in small, small compartments, but actually what it showed was it's a global phenomenon. Women across carry the burden and they carry the suffering more than the rest. So really, so, you know, one of the things that struck us, and again, from our work and in the literature we'll be looking at, is that at least one third of women are exposed to gender uh, partner violence during COVID-19 lockdown, one third. That's very, very high number. One third, you know, so, and I want to say it's not, it's this cuts across low, high, or medium income country. When you look at homicide, one third of the women who have survived from homicide are from, from their partners. And then psychological abuse, COVID 19 has shown us something that totally we weren't expecting. Between 20 to 75% of women have been psychologically abused during COVID 19, 19 lockdown. But one thing that I was looking at, and I, I mean, was we found out that education, attainment, seem to be a protective factor for these women. So I've just, we just contacted Bradford University in, in the United Kingdom to say, is there anything they can do to help develop a program that will support women? Because often, particularly women from ethnic minority, they marry very early, they stop school, so they don't get the certificate they need to come, go for higher job. So Bradford University tried to develop this pathway that will account, that will recognize what women have done, you know, in terms of, you know, where they are suffering and their experience and accredited towards a, a degree program. So really I'm looking forward to working with Universal Bradford to, to promote that. I was looking at, you know, a, pre, a recent report from the World Bank. And again, the World Bank agreed with all of us, the paper, you know, what the thing they just said, what the Dignity Project found, what the WPA found that COVID-19 had a disproportionate suffering on women both financially, financially, emotionally, you know, socially. So I I think, you know, so the World Bank, so I, I, I would recommend you read this paper, you know, but I've taken some extra from it, you know? And they said, look, why, why should we empower women? You know, so this is one of the key things that came from it, that he said that when you look at COVID-19, you know, and that um, let's focus on women issue, there are what's called social norms that prevent women from doing things, you know? So for example, so, social norms say you could marry early, but really what he's saying that we should challenge such social norms because they do not allow or support women to be to get the best they can ever be. Access to health, that women's health are poorly funded all over the world. So it doesn't matter whether it's in Africa anywhere, and that you know, again, you know, even some women have access to sanitary towers and things that they can need to give them dignity and so if you are locked down at home, you, you, you're having your period, you cannot, you don't have appropriate sanitary system, it can be very devastating. So really, so, but these are things that easily can be tackled by, by system. And as I said, it, it, you have the exposure to psychological vulnerability, which I said about. But they think one of the things they looked at was that finance, you know, that the market, the, the system, the current market system, is not very good for women. But and I will come back to that, you know? And uh, so therefore they have poor livelihood, 
Therefore, if you are home with a husband that is already violent, you know, and you, you need money from him all the time, where will you go to? So you have that. And as, uh, because of that, this leads to negative coping strategies in women and, uh, and leads to their burnout. But we know that we need the women to be strong because they are the key. So if they want the to look after the children, who they want the to keep the house together. So really, we need to find things that will protect them. We need to find ways to support them. And we, we need to begin to think about how to challenge the gender, you know, what they call the call gender norms that says men are powerful. So we have to think in a different way. I know we're talking about COVID-19, but we need to think beyond that. So because pandemics will come again, whether we like it or not. So really, if you want us to think about challenging the early marriage that people have all over the world, you know, so how do we think about it, you know, in a way that is different, you know, so that we also educate the men. But I think part of it is ignorance of the men, you know, because if you educate the men, you know, properly, maybe some of the things that we say numb will not be numb. So that's so that's the thing. So let's look at it again, again from World Bank project and again from what we are talking about. When you look, yeah, unfortunately, there are overrepresentation of women in our core healthcare, in health and social care activities. If you look in, in England, for example, most of the bars in England, you know, the, you know, most of them are young women, you know, who work there and the way the COVID-19 happened, what happened, they all lost their job, you know, you know, so and the food preparation, cleaning jobs. But many of the jobs have lower pay than the type of job men get, you know. So you work in the army, you know, you are in the machismo type of job. So this is about again this stereotype as to what is good for a woman, what is good for a man. So really, so if you want to empower women to do well. We need to encourage them to say, actually, you could be an engineer. You don't have, I'm, I'm glad my daughter is an engineer, you know, you know, but you know, but you should you don't have to do only cleaning work. You don't need to be only healthcare assistant. So, really, so I think we have to find a way to begin to highlight that and showcase women that are doing well, because many women do well. You know, they do well, they're in high places, you know. So we need to begin to talk about that, about part of this uh, project. This, this research is from Institute of Physical Health in England. They looked at, you know, the lockdown, COVID-19 lockdown and what happens. So they looked at fathers and mothers. Very interesting, you know, when you look, you know, that in paid job, unfortunately, during the COVID-19 lockdown, less women were in paid job than men. But you can understand why, because some of the, the type of job women did, wasn't it? So therefore, that happened. Even though that, you know, men and women at home, you know, during the lockdown, what happened, housework, women do more housework than the men, <laughs> you know, far, far more than the men. And childcare, again, so the women did all the childcare, majority of the childcare. So you have the men at the home that are paid, you know, during the lockdown, maybe they are on a fellow scheme. A, they don't do housework, B, they don't do childcare. You know, so really, so you can, can see that, that, you know, that we have to find a way to challenge the norms because these are part of the norms that are happening. But in terms of le leisure, men and women do similar leisure activities, of course. You, you're both locked down in the house. What can you do? You can't go out. So therefore, that was the case. And the same of personal care and sleep, you know? So really, so we have to say that mothers, again, at home, took the disproportionate burden of the work, child care, housework and no pay. But it's not all bad news. Let me say something, you know, because I said, you know, that when women are in power, they are very, very good, you know. So I was very happy when I read this paper that countries led by women during COVID-19 did better, you know. So that is a good paper. So I think we needed to showcase this, you know. So it's not about uh, England and France, you know, the men do the machismo, no. They had fewer cases of death, you know, with COVID-19 with country led by women. You know, so, so the women showed more empathy on the system. They showed more care. They invested more in healthcare. You know, so really, so so. But what I'm saying, although we 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 show a picture of women difficulties, women suffering, but when they get to the top, they are they they show it. They provide a different perspective. So really, so I think you know, women. The key, what I was driving at here was that women should not think they can only be healthcare assistants. They should, they should become politicians because they, are the, they should become policy makers. They should go to council because you can make the case, you know, for successes and changes. And, and young women will look forward to look at what you do and try to do it differently. 
I know that the United Nations is very keen also on, on, on the rights of women because I've just joined a team of people who have, you know, who've just made a contribution to the challenges the UN is thinking about, especially for older women. And I, I think you, see, you can see contribute to this till the 22nd. And one of the things we said about it was that, you know, as part of the UN, they should begin to think about what I say, finding a kind of a, not a World Bank, but a type of different bank, you know, a cooperative bank, you know, that can support women, you know, so that they can become more self-sufficient, you know, so, you know, it could be, you know, so really, so we need to think about that. I read about a charity in uh, East Africa where they support women to buy goods, you know, so you give a woman, I can't remember the two goods, and then, they, we did, you know, they're able to feed themselves, feed the family, provide milk and co. I think it, it looks very small, but the report I'm getting from India that is giving the women power to think I don't need my husband for everything. So really, so we need to think again as to how we can empower women better than we are doing now. I think we need more women to be in power. So, so that's the key thing, more women to be in power because they will show the empathy, they will also show the care that's necessary. I think we have to find a way to support NGOs that support women and women issue differently, you know, because and support it financially so that they can support local women in where they are working to empower them to be able to earn money. So if you earn money, you can become more self-sufficient and therefore support your family differently. I think we need to have some joint session between men and women, you know, where they look at things differently because I'm very sure no man wakes up at home to say, I want to be back to my wife, you know, or somehow, you know, you know, they think it's normal. So maybe part of the thing we should be thinking about the future is a kind of a joint workshop between men and women so that they can see things from their own lenses. I said about what Bradford is doing, Investor of Bradford hoping to do about empowering women to education, because if you are not a graduate, you are one third of your wage less, you know? So really, so begin to think about such projects that you know, give them an opportunity to become equal partners in the wealth creation and wealth sharing of the nation. So in a nutshell, so really, so women are the key. And when they hold the key, they hold it well, right? So we need to say that COVID-19 has shown that they have carried a more burden than the rest, but it shouldn't be so. Let's remember that, you know, pandemics will come, crisis will come. Let's think again and work together, you know, for a better society that we'll be proud of, that is good for our mother. Because if you ask a man, how, you, how do you want your mother to be treated is with respect, of course. How do you want your wife to be treated? Um, I'm not sure, you know? So really, we need the, the world that is good for our, our, our mothers. And that's what I want to say, you know, thank you very much for, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor Gabriel. Thank you so much for presenting on how the impact of the pandemic has on you know, women, as well as the different kinds of responsibilities that they take on in addition, you know, compared to work and as well as the vulnerability of their livelihoods, you know, being affected by the pandemic itself. And of course, the importance of women's rights. And I also noticed that, you know, uh, in the chat that, you know, some people have been asking for the data as well as the slides. So I would encourage you to reach out to the respective speakers. If let's say you would like to, you know, get the slides from them, you can email them directly for their slides. All right. So, Without further ado, let us invite our next speaker, Ms. Claudia, to share with us about the Global Mental Health Peer Network as well as its initiatives. Ms. Claudia, please. Cool. All right, so just as um, JD said, um, my name is Claudia Sato. I am Deputy CEO of the Global Mental Health Peer Network. And um, so I thought to take a slightly different stance to the presentation, um, it actually works quite nicely in support of what Dr. Daniel said and um, also with Professor Gabriel. So what I'm gonna talk about is who is the Global Mental Health Peer Network? What do we do? What structures do we have in place that empowers women? Um, and also what are the kinds of activities that we do that empowers women? Um, so I will get that started. Um, and then just for the purposes of the talk, because the name of the organization is so long, I'm just going to call it the Peer Network. So if you just bear with me on that. Um, okay, great. So about us, the Global Mental Health Peer Network is an international mental health um, experts by experience organization. So in other words, persons with lived experience with mental health conditions. Um, it is 100% lived experience orientated. So everybody within the organization um, from our volunteers to our 
executive representatives across the world, staff members, um, we are all lived experience. So that brings quite a nice variety to um, the voices of persons with lived experience. Our global, global office is based in South Africa, um, but we do have representatives over 30 countries and currently sitting on over 70 representatives. Um, so the peer network was developed from the initial movement for global mental health, which was an international virtual network of individuals and organizations of operating from around the world to improve services within a human rights framework perspective. It became a solid foundation for the peer network. And um, from that, the peer network was registered in 2018 as a nonprofit organization. And subsequently in July, 2019, it was registered as a public benefit organization with the South African Revenue Services. And then last year, we were quite fortunate enough to receive our equivalency determination certification, which would recognizes us as um, a, U, a United States public charity, um, which really emphasizes our global presence. So since our establishment, um, we've got two main focus areas or principles that we, we are really passionate about. One is to develop a global leadership of lived experience, so a global community of lived experience persons where we can all share our voices. And then in order to share those voices and ex experiences and perspectives, we provide a sophisticated platform. So that would be the second part. So it's kind of twofold. Um, on the right-hand side of our screen, we'll see the global office, um, which is myself as deputy CEO in the middle. Our founder, Charlene Sinkel, is quite prominent within the mental health field. Um, we can share this later, which you guys will then see what our uh, tasks are, responsibilities. So if there's ever a time you want to reach out, you guys can use this sort of as a, the contact, you know, or the, the guide to reach out to us should you want to collaborate or um, take anything further. And then we've got our project assistance. So purely just from here, even though we're still fairly new, you can see that we're two women and one man. Um, so that kind of just shows the initial um, woman empowerment um, side of our organization. So from this, I wanted to jump in to just briefly touch on the development of the global leadership uh, purpose that we're running. And then I'll talk slightly, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the platform that we have. So jumping in on that. So de developing leadership for, for the peer network is super important. Um, we have created a structure um, which I will explain just after these next two slides, um, sort of the structure that we have in place um, that helps develop people with lived experience. So, um, and what we aim to do with that is by developing and having them in leadership roles or um, getting them into leadership roles through our activities, it will then um, look at all of this and say, okay, cool, we're going to empower them now. There will be effective engagement from their side. Um, they get to meet people from abroad, really make good connections. And everything that we do is really person-centered. It is not focused on the biomedical model. So it's purely a person-centered approach, a human rights approach. And with that said, because we're quite diverse, the perspectives that we get come from such a broad range of people, of circumstances, um, from the lower middle income countries to the higher income countries. Um, and also what are the challenges that each country faces is different. So when we do get um, perspectives from our members, it's really diverse and, and really unique. Uh, to the next one, um, now there we have seen a, an increase in the global recognition of the role of persons with lived experience. And I think to some degree COVID-19 has become the reason that this has sort of escalated um, because now we need to ask persons with lived experience um, within the different realms of mental health, so research, policy reform, uh, service development and meaningful and authenticating um, engagement. Right? So genuine conversations and then we, we aim to have the organizations that we collaborate with actually take their 
recommendations and put it into policy. So it's not merely just a tick box. Um, oh, I've spoken to people with lived experience and it's a tick box. We take that one step further. So that's how we promote their leadership and development. And also through that, we've noticed that there's that global recognition and to include, include people with lived experience. So here's just a nice little chart where you guys can see when we share, when I share the presentation, should you want to have a look. Uh, okay, so the next slide here, this is more about our, um, our structure. Um, and this I think is very important um, to say and explain how we work. So we work from a very systematic approach. So the global structure is, as you can see here, we've got our board of management, um, which is five people. Then we've got our global office, which you had seen in part three. Then we've got regional executive committees, um, members. So that is, we have regional leads from across the world. And then we've got the country representatives. So they kind of work together. And you'll see our country executive committee is established based on the World Health Organization regions. And um, we'll have a look here. So again, just re-emphasizing that everything, everybody in this structure is a lived experience person or an individual. Um, we, and, and what it does is just filters really nicely through that even the chairperson is somebody with lived experience all the way to the volunteer who helps us draft the newsletters that we send out every month on what we do. So that's super important to know that there's so much value within those with lived experience. Further below, you will see two uh, pictures here. So the side um, on the left-hand side, we've got our profile per gender. So if we look at the board of management, we've got two females, two males, staff, it's two females, one male. So you can see from here, I'm not gonna go through it due to time, but that primarily we are more women, sort of run by more women and having involvement more with women. Um, we don't know if this is anything to do with culture, but this is sort of the stats as at this week. Um, we're sitting at more women than we do men. Um, then on, on the right hand side, we've got subcommittees which were created post COVID, um, which helped us identify key uh, areas that need specific focus. So our executive committee members have the opportunity to join these these subcommittees and focus on key areas within their countries and the, the peer network helps with the platform for them to reach and achieve what they think is, is important. So when it comes to women empowerment, we can look at youth having very young, you know, young adults, uh, young ladies trying to step into bigger positions. We've got the LGBTQ and then we've got family and carers as it was mentioned in the previous presentations, we've got a lot of carers, mothers, daughters, so it's important to have this kind of subcommittee in place. So the family carers is, very, is, is still quite um, new, the rest have been established, we're in the process of finalizing the structure for the family and carers. Um, and also to jump on that, what we did is uh, for, on the 8th of March, we commemorated International Women's Day. So we presented a task to our executive committee members and we said, we asked them, you know, if you wanted to see gender equality, or if you want the future to look like gender equality, what is it that you would want? Um, could you give us one or two words? So the, the flyer that you'll see here was based purely on their responses. And bearing in mind that, every, that there's many people within our organization that hold high positions, the women hold high positions. We've got lawyers, psychotherapists, maternal mental health nurses, carers, uh, child and adolescent psychiatrists, peer support workers. So the women are really involved a lot in what we do. Um, and they actually speak up more, which is, is, is also good for us because we get more information. And in everything that we do, because it's person-centered and human rights-centered, we are really working on gender equality, women empowerment, and human rights. Um, okay, so as mentioned before in the other, um, I think Professor Gabriel mentioned that mental health is an extremely important, or advocacy is really important. And 
we couldn't agree more from the peer network. Um, the start of 2020 um, really has COVID impacting on mental health and increases the burden of mental health disorders and there's a big spotlight on mental health now. Um, but from all of that, what we have gathered and from our work over the last year specific to COVID, we've really picked up on peer-led services and support. This seems to be quite a big, um, uh, or it's a common theme that people want to want to take, take up really seriously. So we are working on um, establishing some regulatory body, which is something that we're still busy with, but peer support is something that we're genuinely looking into. That's going to also place a lot of empowerment and leadership into our members and broader. Um, so you can see just briefly here, peer support will help with the reducing of coercion, del service delivery, it will help navigate systems, it can promote recovery and so forth. Um, so there's a little bit just on that. Um, on this slide here, I had mentioned the common themes um, that we had picked up from some of our work. So what we had done was workplace mental health uh, webinars for big international companies across the world. Um, and these were sort of some common um, themes that we brought up, uh, that was raised. So I'm not really going to get into it because this was brought up quite nicely in the previous presentations. Um, so in the initial stages of COVID, um, we offered international banks specifically a lot of workplace and COVID mental health workshops. And there was a lot of engagement and the woman came up with a lot of challenges and they were the ones that actually said to us we cannot be a mother a daughter a sister a carer without um, priority prioritizing our own mental health because if we don't prioritize our own mental health we can't really help our children or our family and even go to work and you know sort of take that role as well um, the peer network also worked alongside fgrp the federation um, global initiative on psychiatry um, which is also very focused on promoting humane and ethical services. And with them, we drafted a joint statement, so we can share that later if, if you wish. We hosted roughly around six to eight months of peer support virtual group sessions to the public. So that was really nice. We got a lot of mainly women attended as well, um, some things to note. And you can see on the right-hand side, um, the UN Secretary General had a nice conversation with Charlene. She's a little bit over there, which you can't see properly. Um, but it was a three-way conversation about um, with another mental health worker about what's the best approach. From this discussion, there was a policy brief launched. I can also share that with you separately. And the three main recommendations that came from that was we need to, as a society and as stakeholders within the mental health profession, apply a whole of society approach um, and ensure we've got emergency services in place for now and post COVID. And then also just building mental health services for the future. I'm not gonna be much longer now, um, but our recommendations from the peer network, and we say this for almost everything that we do is collaboration and joint partnerships are super important. If we can rather um, work together, we can stay stronger together, we can have a bigger voice um, and we can make a bigger impact as opposed to being fragmented and, and staying isolated. And then the second point is meaningful and authenticated engagement. And that goes back to what I mentioned earlier. It's not just a tick box exercise anymore. We don't want that. We refuse to stick to that. So if we are providing services and we're reviewing mental health policies, as soon as we get lived experience voices directly from our committee, we'll also take part in those activities. We ensure that their recommendations do go into the policy changes that we help with. Um, so I think for me, that, that's all I really wanted to say. And if there's anybody on here that has lived experience with a mental health condition, wants to help us drive change, um, whether you're a family member that's looking after someone that has mental health conditions, or whether you yourself are and you feel like you need to take that next step, we are currently recruiting. So we're more than help, happy to receive applications. You can contact me and I'll help you with that. Um, and and it, I think it will just be great to get more people to represent from all over the world. So I just want to say thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that I got to have this conversation. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Claudia, for sharing with us about the different types of you know, initiatives launched by the Global Mental Health Peer Network. Yeah, as well as the different challenges that you guys faced as well, you know, when it comes to the different structures as well as the different initiatives that you have. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. So finally, last but not least, let us invite Ms. Portia to share with us more about the mental health promotion efforts during the COVID-19 pandemic in Singapore. Ms. Portia, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Greeting from Singapore. And hello, Ingrid, Gabby, Claudia, everyone for joining us, as well as Connie from Australia, Prof Chang from Taiwan, Betty, Jonah, Hannah, Jesse, and Zai. Thank you so much for joining us this evening from Singapore. So I'm going to share briefly about what is happening in Singapore. Yeah, so... Um, Okay, the outline will be a uh, psychological impact of uh, COVID-19 and the effort made by government because like uh, many of you mentioned about, um, you know, the contribution and the role of the government in uh, advocating for mental health, as well as NGOs effort, as well as in um, media effort. So the thing is, like Claudia mentioned about collaboration and joint partnership, this is very important. And I guess that's why all of us believe in this and we have especially come together to reach out to everyone at this session. Okay, to begin with the psychological impact of COVID-19. So this is something that I share at the World Federation webinar. It's a sad news, a tragic event uh, that happened during the covid Period. There's a, a depressed a mom who has depression actually killed the, autis, the son with autism before committing suicide in Singapore. And this happened around World Mental Health Day last October, and it was rather disturbing. And I, I, I see the need to address on especially women's mental health because women actually take out multiple roles uh, in the society. So, of course, everybody has been talking so much about COVID. Um, the thing is, according to the studies, there are proof showing that it might lead to anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and insomnia. And uh, for you know, according to an online survey conducted by our team, Silver Ribbon Singapore, one in four experienced low mood, anxiety, and loneliness more than usual during the COVID-19 period. So according to the latest study in Singapore, Prof Jaffa actually uh, and her team from Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore performed 68 studies involving 288 over 1,000 participants from 19 countries to assess the risk factors. And um, they found that um, among the people most affected by COVID-19 are uh, women, younger adults, individuals of lower social economic status, those staying in rural areas, and those who are at risk of COVID-19 infection. So according to Prof Jaffa finding, women were more likely to experience psychological distress than men, consistent with other global studies that anxiety and depression are more common in women. Yeah, so um, the lower social status of women and less perfect, you know, uh, preferential access to healthcare compared to men um, across those 19 countries. And according to her outreach program for mental health services must target at women proactively. So I'm going to share more about what we have been doing in Singapore. So for the government effort, this is what happened. Um, in Singapore, we use or adopt a, a different term from other parts of the world. We didn't use the term lockdown, but we adopt the term circuit breaker. So we had the circuit breaker from 7 April to 1st June, 2020. And um, I managed to obtain the statistic earlier on and actually, there were a total of 60,000 over uh, confirmed cases in Singapore. And that's a total of 30 number of deaths in Singapore. 
and 60 over 1,000 actually recover in Singapore with lots of blessing and with the support of all our dedicated healthcare workers. So during the circuit breaker, there were a whole list of restrictions and there were a lot of people experiencing anxiety because they are not clear of the restriction. And there were some cases where some people were arrested for not wearing a mask in the street and everybody really get paranoid, especially those who are not uh, IT savvy, they do not have access to the social media. So the government also classified some of the businesses where they're supposed or not supposed to be operating during the circuit breaker period, that is your lockdown period. There are a lot of confusion. And in addition to that, there were a number of people who were being retrenched uh, or suffer a pay cut, which actually affect their lifestyle, their, their financial uh, status. So the government actually offer uh, financial support for the community, especially those who have been retrenched. And during the circuit breaker period or the lockdown period, there were a lot of people who were looking for sanitizer. And there are some people who actually mark out the price of the sanitizer. We are almost running out of sanitizer. And uh, the government were quite kind. Uh, they actually offer free sanitizer. And uh, our group was one of the group that helped in volunteering to distribute this sanitizer to the community. And at that time, basic sanitizer, mask was another item that we are running out in Singapore. And the government actually started to distribute few free masks for the community as well to allay our anxiety. And in addition to that, uh, there were a lot of fake news and uh, everybody, like what I said, you know, were experiencing high level anxiety. And in addition to that, you have fake news and you make things worse. So uh, the ministry actually came forward to manage the fake news and start um, implementing some punishment on, on those who start spreading fake news during that period of time. And the government also set up this national uh, care hotline, which my organization, so relevant, is also involved along with other NGOs in Singapore. So we come together to provide free emotional support for the community. And uh, recently, the government also announced that uh, all Singaporeans will get to receive free vaccination. And it's voluntary, it's free of charge, and you will receive two doses of Pfizer Biotech in Singapore. And uh, our team actually are quite blessed and we actually receive both the two doses. And this is a very, very happy news. Uh, which has announced uh, recently that uh, the government announced that 2021 we declare as a year of celebrating women, the rights of the women, the wellness of the women. So this is a very special year. And I think it's very appropriate for me to share with you. I'm not sure whether Singapore is the first country to declare this. And um, actually last week, um, we work together with a government agency, the National Council of Social Service, and they actually launched Beyond the Labour Media Guide uh, to guide all the journalists on how they should uh, report positively on mental health um, so that they won't perpetuate stigma and able to encourage more people to come forward to seek help. So NGOs effort. So we have been highlighting very much on the need to monitor the psychological impact of COVID-19 during this period of time. Uh, for example, uh, there are some people, especially um, women who are working from home, they are feeling extremely stressed out because uh, they have never experienced that. And um, they have to juggle with work as well as taking care of their loved one at home and clearing household chores and taking care of somebody, maybe elderly or their kids. So they are extremely very stressed out. And during our counseling session, some of our clients were asking, uh, am I being productive 
working from home. I feel that I'm not doing enough or I'm, I'm experiencing high level of stress. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing uh, because there's so much to do. So we do have uh, quite a number of women coming forward to seek help. And uh, at our end, we also provide online emotional support. So uh, we are one of the uh, two charity organizations which started to launch this online emotional support even before the lockdown. And we have been distributing this flyer uh, all around among the community and we have been receiving very good response even from other country as well. And we do not charge a single cent. We actually raise our own fund to provide this service. We have been organizing a whole list of online events to engage the community, to let them know that they are not struggling alone. And we have been involving uh, uh, mental health professionals, peers, caregivers, mental health advocates to share about mental health and to encourage everybody to move on with their life during this difficult period. And uh, I remember Gabby earlier on shared about the importance of uh, collaborating with policymaker. So we work very closely with the policymaker in Singapore and uh, we will hold some events or talks uh, to, to encourage them to come forward to join us uh, to talk about stress management or the impact of uh, COVID-19. Yeah, we also start sharing all these messages on social media, self-care is not selfish act, and you know, asking them, you know, sending messages to check on each other. And uh, this is being uh, shared on uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram. Uh, Eunice Olsen is, uh, used to be our Miss Singapore, Miss Universe, and um, she is a very active advocate for women's rights as well as mental health. And uh, she has been running this Women Talk regularly, and she'll always offer us a platform to share about mental health. And we work with a number of companies, and we try to encourage more companies to come forward to collaborate with us. And we emphasize a lot on corporate social responsibility. And there's one of the company, Pokari, that's a, quite a popular drink in Singapore. And we have virtual run as well as some talks on wellness. We also work closely with the religious group and we start conducting talks at the churches, collaborating with some of the pastor and the priests. And this is interesting for those who go shopping, especially for women. We actually have all these um, stickers on the floor when it comes to uh, this, uh, safe distancing, we start having the sticker and on the sticker, we start spreading all these positive uh, mental health messages to encourage them to move on while they are shopping. And we also hold all these workshops and talks to encourage more people to come forward and uh, to educate them on the warning sign of mental health, uh, mental disorder and the resources available. And this is an online uh, mental health survey that I shared that we realized that one in four actually were experiencing loneliness, low mood and anxiety more than usual during the COVID period. And of course, we set up this uh, global mental health project um, that's called the Global Alliance for Mental Health Advocate. And we are quite blessed to have a representative from uh, you know, 18 countries across the world to come forward to share the ideas and uh, resources and uh, we advocate together. And we actually invited our President Halima Yaakov uh, to launch this uh, mental health uh, project. It's a global mental health project. And you see all the representatives on the stage launching together with her. And I see a uh, majority are actually women. And we have all these mental health exchange talks and inviting representatives from Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, Canada, uh, South Africa, uh, Greece to share about what's going on. Uh, and share about mental health promotion at their own countries. Yeah, and uh, this October, we are quite blessed uh, in a way that we are hosting this conference on mental health. Do feel free to join us. And uh, we are blessed to have the support of Ingrid with us as well. And of course, our guest of honor will be a female 
There's uh, Madam Halima Yaakov, there's the president of Singapore. And me, the effort, I'll share with you never in my life, except during the circuit breaker or the COVID period, where we have so many media coverage about mental health. So uh, we are quite encouraged because like, we are glad that the government is really looking into mental health, investing in it, and uh, providing more resources for the community to address their mental health issues. So uh, this is my last slide. I'd like to thank once again, Gabby, Ingrid, Claudia, and everyone for joining this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Posh. So thank you so much for all the presenters for sharing you know, about their organization, as well as the different challenges, as well as the initiatives and strategies that you know, they are implemented in different organizations or countries to actually combat and promote mental health during this COVID-19 pandemic. So right now, we would like to proceed on into the question and answer the Q&A segment for this event. So perhaps um, if let's say anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself, okay? And you can ask the questions, you know, verbally to our speakers. Okay, so I think, you know, just as a question to all our speakers first, right, okay? So in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest hurdle to overcome when it comes to mental health advocacy? You know, especially, you know, for, to promote mental health, especially for women. And what are your recommendations to overcome these hurdles? Yeah, so perhaps we can invite the speakers to share your thoughts on this. Yep. Would Dr. Ingrid like to go first? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think one of the biggest barriers is when we speak about mental health, we speak about it very generally, globally, as well as nationally. And if we're wanting to focus specifically on specific actions for the impacts of the gender linked impact of, of COVID-19 on mental health for women, we need to extract, we need to focus, we need to pull it out and we need to prioritize. Um, and I, I think in, in talking about the impact generally on mental health of all people, which is important as well, uh, we sometimes lose the um, the challenges that women face and have faced during these very difficult times. And in losing that conversation, we lose the focus and we lose the opportunity to find ways to better support women during this time. Um, as we saw in from my presentation, um, women are the most affected during this time. And so therefore it should be prioritized. We already started off on a negative base, you know, a deficit base. When you look at the treatment gaps in mental health interventions globally, as well as within countries and more specifically low middle income countries. So I think we're really needing to refocus and in every presentation, I believe we should be pulling out and prioritizing women and women's mental health during COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid. Uh, Professor Gabriel, would you like to go next to answer in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest hurdle to overcome when it comes to mental health advocacy? And what are some of your recommendations? Well, thank you very much for uh, the question. A couple of things. One issue of stigma and discrimination happens to people who people with mental health and their family. So there's always that, you know, and therefore people are not coming forward. You know, so, so if you put people hide, you know, because of the worries about stigma and discrimination. If, if, you, if you have on your medical notes, you suffer from men, men, medical, uh, mental illness, when you go to hospital, you don't get the best care. You know, so you don't get the best care. So therefore people, of course, will hide, they won't they want to disclose that. So really, so one of the things we need to say is that first of all, we need stronger laws to promote people with mental health and mental illnesses. I think we need policy to be very strong to say that discrimination because you have a mental illness is not allowed. I was speaking to the president of the World Psychiatric Association. He said to me last week, psychiatrists who treat patients also have discrimination because by association. So really, so he wants to work with us to advocate so that we can. So, so it's, I think we need to be thinking like the me to approach that first of all, there's nobody that is immune against mental illness. So that's one thing. It's, there's nobody that does not know somebody that has a mental illness or distress. Well, but yet, when we come to the public, we don't want to talk about it. So we keep quiet, it becomes a taboo. As long as you have that, we continue to have this problem. I told you about what I call the social norms. 
we've, ha we've, we've created some norms that are not real, you know, that where you, you say, you because you have a mental illness, you cannot do this. Because you're a woman, you cannot do this. Because you are black, you cannot be this, you know? So you have a series of social norms that we've agreed, you know, to carry on, you know, along with, but we know they're not correct. So, so they say what I call the failure of the collective unconscious. So collectively as a system, we have failed. So we need to articulate. So we need people like yourselves, you know, your peer support network to articulate that. I'm, I've, I've had a mental illness, but I'm the deputy chief executive of this organization. You know, so, uh, you know, think about, you know, I've, I've had a mental illness, I became the president of an organization. So I think we need more of that. So people can see that it's not a sign of failure. It's not a sign of weakness. Actually, it's a sign of, resilience that I can go through it, you know, because it's, I've gone through the suffering and here I am. So I think, so we need to change the language. And this is why one of the reasons that uh, I'm going to deviate from my role in dignity to, to WFMH. This is why I like the WFMH, you know, about one mental health day. And I really, that like we can articulate and say, me too, you know, so, so I hope we can begin to do that. Because, you know, there's no, I've got family people with mental illness, you know, but I'm proud to say it because I can say it because I know we can seek treatment, but not all that can say that because they cannot have treatment. So I think that's it in a nutshell, you know, that a new approach, a new language, a new paradigm, so that we can say actually it could be any of us. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gabriel. You know, yeah, I agree with you. A new approach and a new language is definitely needed when it comes to promoting mental health. Yeah, so Miss Claudia, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um... Very good question. So I think for me, um, using the experiences that I've, I've, I've been through with the peer network, um, what we found is that um, we've had to narrow down specific concepts. So stigma and discrimination is a concept worldwide, right? So when we, when we work within our, um, our different regions and countries, we ask our members, what are your, what are the key barriers or what are the barriers and what are the key aspects within your country that needs attention so that we can help you, um, you know, reach out to the right stakeholders and, and promote and help that. So with that said, for example, Africa, while stigma and discrimination is still very big in Africa, um, they're becoming, they're actually our biggest region with the most members, um, which means that there are people that are now really trying to come forward and, and speak up and make, and they're doing campaigns and they're really doing such great work. And um, with that, we then found having more and more conversations. And I think that's what's so necessary is these conversations, um, is we then found, okay, so we've got the generalized idea of stigma, but now there's self-stigma. So the stigma that you put on yourself and then there's stigma within the psychiatry field, the field of psychiatry within mental health professionals themselves. So what we now have done is, okay, so now we've reached out to various psychiatrists around the world and next week, Friday, we're actually having a webinar purely to discuss what are the barriers? Why is it happening? What can we do? What are the opinions of these people that are going through these types of things? Because if we don't ask, we're not gonna know how to proceed, right? So while there is so many barriers, um, I feel like all the stakeholders that are involved in mental health promotion, mental health awareness, mental health advocacy, should always seek out an organization that has lived experience within their own structures, because you are going to get the most valuable information because it's coming directly from people that are struggling. The second thing is, what does lived experience mean, right? Um, does it mean you have to have a diagnosis? in order to be part of an organization such as ourselves. No, it doesn't. It means have you previously used a healthcare system for maybe just therapy or have you just used medication for a short period of time? Have you experienced trauma, anxiety, depression when you were studying or at work? So we have our own charter that explains lived experience, which we feel have we've broadened it so that we can really encapsulate as many people as we can into this title, so to speak, right, so that we can have as many voices as possible. Um, and then the third thing is peer support. This is the way forward for everything, in our opinion, um, because there is always, there's always going to be stigma, and hopefully the next generation doesn't have to deal with that, but, you know, because we're talking about it so much now, maybe they won't have to, but the reality is that it still exists, and we are working as an organization on 
developing a peer support training structures so that peer support is not only just colleague to colleague, let me help you, let's talk about what's happening, I'm relatable, but defining what it means to be a peer support worker. So that if you get, um, as just as an example, you get, um, you're having an episode at home or you, you're not feeling well, you've got to go to hospital, who's, instead of going straight to your clinicians, what's the middle, what is the in-between process? Who can you talk to in between? Because sometimes it's about prevention and not necessarily curing. So those are conversations that kind of link in with everything. So like Professor Gabriel mentioned, stigma is a huge thing, but maybe a peer support worker could step in before we go to the professionals. So there's those sorts of things that we've seen from our experience. Um, so I, I hope that's, that's answered your question, but yeah, very good question. Thank you very much, Ms. Claudia. Uh, finally, uh, Ms. Portia, would you like to have a go at the question? Thank you, Yenten. Actually, it, it is always challenging when you talk about mental health advocacy. And of course, um, it's still the same thing, like what Claudia said earlier on, collaboration and joint partnership. Um, mental health is everyone's responsibility. So it's not simply the, the job of the psychiatrist. I mean, like many a times, especially in Singapore, you know, everybody will just say, oh, it's because of the psychiatrist, you know, or it's because of the caregiver is not doing enough, you know, but I, I just feel that everybody plays a part. It's only possible if let's say, everyone can recognize that each of us play an important role in advocating for mental health, be kind and, uh, you know, able to acknowledge the importance of mental health. Uh, yeah, uh, the ability to acknowledge the importance of mental health is very important. As what I have said during the earlier presentation, women play multiple roles. And at times we play too many roles until we overlook the importance of taking care of uh, our mental well-being. We overlook and uh, we neglect our health, our mental health. That's an important part. So I think public uh, public education and partnership, the two piece is very important. Thank you, Yenten. Thank you so much, Ms. Porsche. Uh, I see that someone has raised her hand, uh, Ms. Jo Joanna. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for those presentations. I think they really fantastically reframed the debate. I commented on that earlier in the chat box that that is so important. And I'm from Northern Ireland, so a corner of the UK and mental mental health is massively under-resourced. Access for women is particularly poor for different reasons. But my question is that there has been increasingly quite a lot of talk about mental health here, but it is still that idea that, that it's an individual level problem and it even extends to suicide. We have an incredibly high suicide rate that affects primarily young men, but it how do we begin? What's your advice on how do we begin reframing it that this is actually a cross-cutting issue because there's also work on a gender equality strategy here, but that's very narrow and, and one department take responsibility when actually, you know, as you say, women's mental health is the result of all those things across the life sphere. How do we make policymakers listen? Thank you so much for your question, Ms. Jonah. Um, who would like to have a go at a question first? Uh, perhaps um, Dr. Ingrid, would you like to go ahead? Thank you so much, uh, Jonah. I think the challenges that you face in Ireland, in Northern Ireland is not um, um, unique to me. For example, in South Africa, where about uh, close to between 92% to 90, between 92 to 90, 5%, depending on where you are, people have no access to treatment, and these are people living with mental, uh, mental disorders. So I'm very familiar with the context that you're describing. Um, and so what we have done and what we promote, as well as the World Federation for Mental Health, and it came through very clearly last year in our campaigning around World Mental Health Day, where we were calling on governments to invest in mental health. Because, you know, the return on investment for in, in mental health is enormous, has enormous benefits for countries, you know. And, and I think if we focus on the investment call again and hold our politicians accountable, we need leadership. We need our politicians, our, our presidents to be showing leadership in this matter. Um, 
and to ensure that our health budgets begin to shift. On average, we know about 4% globally of health budgets uh, are spent on mental health. That's never going to begin to address the challenges we're talking about. Um, so um, um, our recommendation would be, you know, um, to really ensure that our, uh, our political leaders um, um, really start to change the policies, to change the investment agenda when it comes to, um, to mental health specifically. And as you said, it's a, 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 a mental, the, the, the mental health challenges that women face, it's a, it's a cross-cutting issue, you know. Um, and there are ways in which uh, we can provide very cost-effective mental health services that don't cost a lot. There's a lot of amazing um, innovation, particularly if you look at a mental health gap and some of the innovations coming through. Um, it, it's doable, it's possible, but it needs political will. And it does call on us as mental health advocates to hold our governments accountable, to hold countries accountable, to make this investment in mental health. You cannot begin to address this treatment gap um, with a minute little 4% of your health budget for mental health. And if you look at that, if you draw down to that 4%, it's mainly infrastructure and facility, hospital facility type costs. We're talking about community-based interventions that provides mental health care and support for people to live an integrated life to have a journey of recovery that he respects their dignity and their human rights and their right to treatment, their right to um, health, the right to live um, a, a life as an equal citizen in their country and a global citizen across the world. So it's, it's, it re, it's going to require a lot more advocacy on our side. Um, it's going to require for us to, around the specific agenda, to ensure that in every policy, in every mental health legislation, in every intervention plan, that the interventions for women have a specific focus, that there is always a specific focus. So yes, it is a huge challenge, this extreme treatment gap. And as I said earlier on, we started, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit um, the world, mental health was already um, on the back foot, <laughs> you know, and then came COVID-19, which added an additional layer of um, need for resources. And, and I can imagine that that gap has actually got, got bigger. There is though the one advantage and the advantage is that because of COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a lot of focus in the media um, and discussions around the impact of mental health. So let us use that opportunity as, as globally, there's a lot of discussion showcasing. And I said it earlier on, it's the negative somatic twin of COVID-19 is this mental health fallout, is to use that uh, media exposure and to hold, as I said, governments accountable, that we collaborate. We, we can't do this in silos anymore. We don't have the resources to do that. But we need to come up with a uh, local and national country level plan for shifting this agenda. Um, and the call is for return on a, a better investment so that there will be the benefits for the country in terms of um, costs, reduction as well as having um, citizens more able to perform their role um, across the world. So that's my response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid. Um, would any of the other speakers like to add on to the question? Yes, let, me try, let me try. Joanna, thank you very much for a very good question. Okay, and uh, I've been working on this field for many years and I agree with you, it's very, been very slow. But I think, I think strongly that the key to this is to tackle stigma and discrimination. So we see we, and also for more people that understand mental health to be in leadership. Let me start with the leadership aspect first, then I'll come to the stigma issue. I was lucky to be the chair of a clinical commissioning group uh, many years ago that controlled 400, uh, about 800 million pounds. I was very lucky, I said that, you know, because I applied for it and I got the job. And what did I do? One of the things I did was actually to look at the reason why we had a lot of patients in hospitals. So 30% of the patients were driving the cost of our hospital budget. So we brought in KPMG, you know, um, PwC, big accounting firm to look at this. Why, what is happening? And what did they find? They found out that the majority of those 30% that were driving the cost had concurrent mental illness with their, with, as part of their illness. So it didn't matter whether it was asthma, COPD, diabetes, cancer, as soon as you have a comorbid mental illness, your cost went up. 
you went to more casualty, you went, you spent more time in hospitals. So during my period, I made sure we invested in social care, invested in mental health activities, and supported psychological therapy. Obviously, I finished the job, but whoever kicked me up, and I'm, I'm going to look at to see what the new people have done. But we also made sure we made the case in our in our commissioning group that mental was a driver of of that. And I think those of you, all of us, should do more research and make sure we publicize that actually if you invest in mental health, you reduce hospital costs. And I think COVID-19 will push to that because the government will not be able to fund hospitals. They won't be able to fund health as they used to do. So let's come up with ideas because they want to save costs anyway. We can show that. So that's one thing. We need mental health service users to be on boards of hospitals to, you know, so in look to be part of commissioning group. Put yourself forward to go onto the board because you can ask the question because when you have challenges, you don't ask the question, nobody will ask it. So really, so the, therefore, the, you will not, we don't have a voice in, uh, in, on the policy platform. So really, so we're gonna have to do that. And I'll give an example. Again, I did some work many years ago in Chile when I was part of Wonka in the public health forum. And we looked at how to support public health transformation in, in Chile. And one of the things they did in a place called Macu was that they set up a board, a local health board, that were made of citizens. So before you had the major, before you go to the government, you had a board that looked at what was happening locally and they were very different. So, and they prioritized mental health. So they in the board. And so, so we need to get into policy. We need to get to management because if you are not in management, who will do it for you? Nobody understands what you're doing. So that would be the case. And then let's come back to the issue of stigma. Unfortunately, because we don't come out. So let, let me give you a good, small example, another example. If I tell you today, if you invest one pound, you will make 20 pound savings, you know, in the treatment of cancer, the government will jump at it. Everybody will jump at it because everybody will talk about it. But if you say the same in mental health, it's not published. Nobody hears about it. Nobody knows about it, you know? So we need publications. We need to agitate. So differently from what we're doing. So I, so I think we need to start doing that. We need to lobby government, you know? So one of the things WFO used to do, well, we had somebody in the US, at the UN that used to lobby for us. Maybe we need to go back to that, you know? Paid people lobby, so speak, you know? Who we know, we paid you to speak for us. Please speak for us. But as long as we sit in our home and complain and moan, nothing will happen. We got to be, we have to engage with the youths, young people, invest in the young people because they're the future. You know, so to actually help us, you know? Twitter, Facebook, all these kind of things. We are not good at it, you know? We need to be better. We need, we need to, to, be, to, to do things differently. So it's a new language, a new, a new way of doing things. The old way has helped, but cannot do more than it's doing now. We need a new approach. We need to put pressure on government because without policy, no matter how good we think we are, it won't work. You know, so we need to put pressure on them to say, we need, we, we need you to do this. And we should be a vocal, be advocate. We should go to campaign, go to the street to carry placards. But sitting down at home and complaining won't work. So that's what I'm going to suggest, that a new approach, a new partnership of equals. So service users, advocacy organization, professionals, all working together and coming to say, this is not working in Ireland, you know, but we, it's, it's worked somewhere else. Why don't you copy what's happening there? And don't be ashamed, Your, Your Honor, to say, this is not working. If you don't say it, nobody else will say it. Everybody feels the same, that whatever who will speak first. Please speak first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gabriel. Um, yeah, any other speakers would like to add on? Uh, yes, Ms. Claudia, please go ahead. Um, thanks, Jenna, for the question. Um, so I'm gonna take a slightly different approach to answering your question. Um, so I think the first thing is, um, so you mentioned, for example, like your suicide rates have really gone up and, you know, that's something to, to be concerned about, obviously. But I think with that, we need to look at the behind the scenes and say, okay, um, we need to firstly start changing the language. So now we don't just, like, for example, we don't say um, this person committed suicide. It kind of uh, sort of criminalizes that that aspect it almost seems like this person should have been locked up first before they did it 
you, you know, because it's kind of almost sounds like it's committing an offense. So we need to start. So it's about educating on language in all aspects of mental health. So stigma, uh, suicide was just an example that I thought would be nice to use. But there's a lot of other things that we say. Um, somebody, I think Leonida in the group chat also said some parts of Africa, or a lot of parts of Africa, as soon as you say mental illness, it's it's about somebody's being possessed, demonized. So again, we're now moving into another realm of something else. So language is very key in how we present to stakeholders, right? So when it's, it's going to be like rather instead of suicide, you say death by suicide or, you know, passing away from. So you change that a little bit. But with that said is we've got to start at the grassroots level. And so the purpose of an organization such as the peer network is that if we have representatives in Ireland, Northern Ireland, for example, who say to us, you know what, these are, our, as, these are the, the issues that we're facing in our country. What, what do we do? How do we reach government? What, what can we do? So what we then do as the, from the global office is we say, okay, we take each country, we write down what are the main action points that need to be done. We work together alongside each other. So we've got people that have just started or have just joined us, for example. Then we've also got those that have already been with us for two years. So the level of expertise is different, but we teach each other, we skill share. So what happens then is those from the grassroots level get empowered. They get, they sort of learn more about the leadership of taking on advocacy roles. Um, and then they move in, they have the option then to move into a mentorship program where they teach the newly onboarded members. This is how, these are good ways to do things. This is what works, this is what doesn't. So having an organization that has people that are passionate about this, that have gone through some form of mental health issues, right, makes a huge difference because it's, we listening, we are as the global office listening to what's happening across the world. And we're taking that information and we're trying to change things. So what we then do is we say, okay, so common areas seem to be, um, I'll just use stigma, for example, um, or education. And we say, okay, we're going to draft a proposal. We send that out to funders based on what our members are raising as concerns. So that's how we then use our platform to reach out to the bigger organizations and to the funders to then help us. So please give us X amount of money so that we can work on creating campaigns. We can work on policy reform. We, as you see how it all filters through. And then eventually we reach the bigger, the bigger stakeholders to make that input, to make that impact. And then, as I had mentioned in the presentation, our main recommendation is that it's partnerships and the second one being meaningful engagement. So it's not good enough that I hear you say, you know, government's not hearing us. We then as the organization all together work nicely together to say, okay, a Northern Ireland has spoken and these are the issues. So please take that and put this into your reform. So we take it that step further. So that's sort of how we operate. So I hope that kind of answers your question, but that's, I think the, what's been working for us is to reach the bigger people through that platform. Thank you so much, Ms. Claudia. Finally, um, Ms. Posh, would you like to take, yeah, would you like to share your views on this? Thank you, Yenten. Um, after hearing from uh, Claudia, and actually we do have a question uh, in the chat box by our supporter, Connie. And uh, she actually uh, asked this question that I know we have laws around covering suicide. What's the change with the new guide? Uh, I mean, like it's in line with the this topic. That is, how are we presenting mental health? It's about the perception towards mental health. And um, when I first started this NGO, I faced a lot of problem. I faced a lot of problem in getting people to collaborate with us. I faced a lot of problem on applying for funding to support our program and services. I faced a lot of problem on involving policymakers. So I try to ponder what's wrong with that. And I realized that there's a highly stigmatized issue. It's a taboo. And in Singapore, it's part of the Asia country where um, mental health is a taboo. Nobody there to talk about it. So I got to start 
getting people to adjust their mindset. It's not about even changing mindset because they have this mindset for years. So we have to adjust this mindset slowly. And I try to work closely with some of the policy maker. I volunteer my time with them. And wherever they have any challenges or they have residents behaving very strangely as what they said, I'll say, can we join you? Can we volunteer our time to show you that through the collaboration and as we involve all the stakeholders to handle this crisis, they will be able to move on with their life. And some of the policymakers were willing to accept our proposal. They give us a try. And after settling or managed to revo- uh, resolve some of the cases, they start having faith in, in uh, mental health intervention. So it's about us you know, putting some effort in adjusting the mindset. And we have to be very patient. It's never easy, especially those who have actually a uh, very uh, unpleasant encounter with some persons with mental health issue, or they have very limited knowledge and they draw a conclusion based on their cons- uh, assumption after reading a negative report. Uh, you know. And another thing I talk about media guide. Media guide is very important because in Singapore, most of the time they try to link a, a crime um, with a mental health condition in Singapore. So we see the importance of developing and launching this media guide to to advise or to get the support of the journalists to report mental health in a positive way and stop linking up uh, all this tragic event by mentioning uh, about a certain mental health condition until, you know, I think uh, this is very important. So you can't blame people for having negative impression because they start reading all the negative news they start, you know, and they have very limited knowledge. So public education, collaboration, and we've got to put in effort to adjust the mindset. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Porsche. There is another question for, for perhaps um, Dr. Ingrid as well as uh, Prof. Gabriel, because I think one of the bigger events that, you know, comes to mental health promotion is World Mental Health Day. So can I invite Dr. Ingrid to share a bit more about what's the theme for World Mental Health Day for 2021? Uh, Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I think it's a very appropriate theme and we've been through an entire process. And again, I just want to thank Professor Iftajaro, who's our Secretary General, um, and in in ensuring that we brief the global world about the theme. So please, you can go onto our website, but it's a great honor for me to announce that the theme for this year is mental health in an unequal world and how appropriate. It's an amazing opportunity for us to advocate. It's an amazing opportunity for us to highlight the gaps and the inequalities that people with mental health face and the disparities that they they encounter. Um, So a wonderful theme to work with. um, And we're very proud of the way in which this theme was decided. It was done by a global survey. So this is a global opinion really about what the theme should be for this year. Um, And so please go onto our website. uh, That's the World Federation for Mental Health website. There'll be updates. There's a brief at the moment that has been uploaded uh, for you to read more about why the specific focus, but in the COVID-19 pandemic space that we're operating, it is, is, it is a thing we can really work with. It's a thing we can lobby, we can use it to, um, to highlight, as I said, uh, some of these uh, um, disparities and inequalities um, and areas of, of discrimination that people are still facing today um, um, and, and as a result of um, many factors, as we've discussed in this very important uh, session today, uh, but mental health in an unequal world, you know, it's a moment for us to raise the issues and call for this investment, call for the redress, and call for a world that will make um, mental health a reality for everyone and not for the few. So um, I am going to ask uh, Professor Ifejaro to add as well that it's an amazing theme and we're very excited about it. We had great impact last year um, in terms of um, you know, activating and campaigning and with our major global international partners. And this year we want to have even greater impact 
in terms of contacts and spread. So our goal is 100 million, um, if not more, but we need all of you to participate, to spread the word, it's the moment, and the documentation will be made readily available to all of you to use in your campaigning. It is the moment, ladies and gentlemen, let's use it. Um, it's a global campaign, it's supported by the World Health Organization and the United Nations, and so let's just move forward, use this opportunity. So it's my call and my plea to all of you to join us um, in really raising the, uh, the real issues that people are facing in this very unequal world. It's not, an, it's not a, 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 a world that is kind to many people who live with mental health challenges daily. So I'm gonna ask uh, Professor Ifejaro if he could just add, because he's been um, you know, obviously operationalizing um, the campaign and the work that we'll be doing going forward. Yeah, thank you, President. You know, I'm really, you know, really grateful to be able to, to be part of today's event. So one of the things I want to say for us that we like you to be part of the, the great push towards this success, you know. So drop me an email, you know. So to all of you, drop me an email and I will respond back to you or my office very quickly to ask to, to ask you what you intend to do and how we can support you. It may also be that we will commission you to write articles and pamphlets for us, you know. So if you whatever skills you have, it's a collective thing. So really, so that's all I want to say immediately that. We officially published it yesterday on behalf of our president and the board, you know, and therefore the time has come. Um, we want you to be an advocate to join us, come with your thing, how you want to do it differently, and we will work with you. You know, that uh, so really, so nothing to say than to say we are here to support you, we are here to work for you, and it's a partnership. So drop me an email and then we'll pick it up from there. It may be also. You know, sometimes we, we use main languages. It may be that you want to translate something or you want a small aspect of it or a big aspect, but we have a big event, we publicize this also for you. So really, well done to all of you. You know, we need to do something. And uh, anyway, uh, this is just, this is the beginning. That's all I want to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid and Professor Gabriel. Thank you so much for sharing about the theme for Women's Health Day 2021. So actually, I have received a question for all of the panelists. So what are your thoughts on the collective healing notion? Yeah, uh, Ms. Claudia, would you like to go have a go at the question? Sure. Um, the collective healing, as in with mental health conditions? I'm just trying to understand what, what the question was. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, perhaps we can, I can invite the uh, person who asked the question to uh, mm. clarify. Ms. Ms. Aya? Yes. Yeah, th that's exactly what I meant. Like, um, and, and in regards to mental health condition, in regards to um, as activists working, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and we face... Uh, a lot of pressure and traumas and how can how can there be a room for collective healing mm -hmm. in the midst of what we're facing yeah. like um especially last year like during COVID how can we practice that yeah well that's a really good question um and I'm gonna kind of answer it um with my two hats so um while I am a mental health advocacy leader and deputy CEO of the Peer Network, I'm also a wellness counsellor. Um, so I have found that a lot of um, professionals, non-professionals and mental health advocates are taking a lot of strain from last year, well, for the last year with COVID and, and all the changes. Um, and it becomes really difficult to find that balance again. And also everything that you're hearing from clients or patients or yourself, um, what are you you would always need to look at what are the self-care um, modalities or techniques that you may have in place um, i like to rely on something called the broaden and build theory so what do you have currently in place that you can broaden and build or you know and work on to enhance your well-being because remember um, i think i mean mental well-being is your social your spiritual your physical state of mind um, so it's all of that combined. So what can you do on a holistic basis or from a holistic approach to help yourself? So definitely um, things like your meditation and your self-care and your yogas and things like that. Also very important is peer support. And that's why we're harboring on it so much because if you 
are feeling really bad, you should be able to have somebody in the clinic for you as a peer support specialist or worker or at your workplace or, you know, so that you could turn to someone to talk to that's relatable. Um, so this is something we are working on. We, we do a lot of wellness webinars, so you're more than welcome to join us. It's monthly. Um, you'll find it on our page, but um, try and look at it from what is it that you need? Is a trauma debriefing? If so, does your company have that in place or do you know what to do, you know, to help yourself? So really investigate what it means for you because each person's different. Um, I don't know if that's answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Claudia, for taking that question. Um, I noticed that uh, Prof, Pro, Professor Chung has been sharing in chat. So Professor Chung, would you like to share? Yeah, so I'd just like to say today is the happiness day. So say my regard to everyone and mm. for WFMHR. And also because today also is the spring breakup. They are not even. It also shows the harmony, equal, and the uh, balance. So this is also for women who have surgery for WFMH. We also can use today as a tool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chang. So to the rest of the audience, um, do you all have any further questions for our speakers? So if let's say there are no other questions, I think we are also approaching the end of the session. So I would like to thank everyone for your time once again, and a special thanks to the four speakers for taking your time out to you know, share wonderful knowledge and experiences with everybody here today. And we'd really like to thank you for taking the questions from the audience. Yep, so thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take good care.